Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our 12th FreeBSD Friday. I'm Deb Goodkin, the Executive Director of the FreeBSD Foundation. I'd like to thank you all for watching this right now, whether you're watching it live or if you're watching the recording. You can find all the upcoming talks and recordings for the past talks on our website, and we'll post the link in the IRC channel here. If you have a question during the talk, you can post it in this chat box on IRC. And if it's a question, please proceed it with a capital Q. So today, our presentation is an introduction to D-Trace by Mark Johnston. So let me tell you a little bit about Mark. Mark is an independent contractor based in Toronto, currently working for the foundation and several commercial FreeBSD users. He's been a FreeBSD source committer since 2012, mainly working on the kernel and has used D-Trace nearly every day since. In his spare time, he plays the cello and deep dives into developing delicious dumplings. So now I'll hand this off to Mark. Thanks, Deb. Um, so let me just get my slides up. That going. So I'm going to be talking about D-Trace. D-Trace is a tool intended to help diagnose problems with systems uh, running in production primarily. Um, so rather than try and give a, so D-Trace is a fairly powerful tool. Um, it's got a lot of uh, components. It's It's got its own little programming language. And rather than try to exhaustively go over it uh, and, and give you information that's already available on the internet, I wanted to present the, the high-level concepts behind D-Trace and give a lot of examples um, around how, how I use it in my day-to-day in my -day work. Um, so if, if you've been using FreeBSD, you've probably heard of D-Trace. Uh, you might not know very much about it. Um, so hopefully with this, you'll, you'll have some ability to, to go out and, and further research uh, D-Trace-related topics and, and um, get a better understanding of, of how you can use it. Um, so here we go. Um, so it's pretty fair to ask. D-Trace is something that comes up uh, in, in mailing list conversations on IRC and so on very often, but what exactly is it? Well, it's a, it's a so-called dynamic tracing framework. And that doesn't really answer the question directly, but um, it's, it's easy to understand given some, some context and a common problem that arises when you're running uh, FreeBSD or really any, any operating system in production. Um, you have some server which is maybe running a, a database server, or maybe it's handling, uh, it's, it's running a web server, it's serving some sort of requests from, uh, from client systems, um, and it works great. You run it for several months in production, it does all the things it's supposed to do, and then for some reason, um, a, a problem arises, there's some sort of anomaly. You know, maybe your latency, uh, your, your request latency goes up by an order of magnitude, maybe the number of uh, database transactions per second you're doing, drops, maybe it only happens in the middle of the night for an hour and then everything else is fine. Um, so if you're a system administrator or a developer working on, on that kind of system, uh, you, you're going to want to fix it, hopefully. Um, so on FreeBSD and, and really any self-respecting Unix, you have a plethora of command line programs that can give you a picture into what's going on in the operating system, in particular what's going on in the operating system kernel. So on FreeBSD, I've given a short list here, we have top, VMstat, Netstat, Sysstat, Procstat, um, you know, a whole bunch of others, and they, they kind of give you answers to canned questions. So uh, if I want to look at all the active TCP connections and, uh, you know, see, see how many are in a particular state, I can run Netstat. Um, Socstat can give me similar information. Um, all of these programs are, are very useful, to be clear. Um, I, I use them all the time. I think they're uh, D-Trace aims to complement them rather than replace them. Um, but they're, they're fundamentally limited. And the reason is that they, they use usually private interfaces to the kernel to gather information about the kernel state, and then it displays that state to the user. Um, so if the information you want isn't anticipated, like the programmers who wrote this, who wrote these tools, wrote them to, to answer specific questions about the kernel state. And uh, if you happen to have a question that isn't answered by one of these tools, well, 
without something like DTrace, without a dynamic tracing framework, you're, you're kind of stuck. Um, there's, you know, it, it, these programs give you a lot, uh, a lot of uh, visibility, but ultimately they're not extensible. So NetStat might give me a clue into the, into the source of a problem, but uh, at a certain point, I might, my, my questions about the, the, the kernel networking subsystem might become too specific for NetStat to be able to answer. So without a dynamic tracing framework, your next step is usually, if, if you're an OS programmer or if you happen to be in contact with some OS programmers, is to say, oh, hey, there, there's some extra information I need. Can you add it? And maybe maybe they go do that. Maybe it takes a couple of weeks. You have to reboot your system. It's, it's real painful. Um, so what a dynamic tracing framework allows you to do is uh, instead of using existing tools to answer canned questions, you can ask your own questions of the kernel. Um, and those questions are, are encoded in little programs that get dynamically loaded into the kernel's address space and they get executed. So conceptually, it's actually pretty similar to the way kernel modules work. A kernel module is just kernel code. It's been compiled. We have a facility for loading it. Uh, you know, mo most mo most uh, operating systems have something like that. Um, so conceptually, DTrace is, is allowing you to do the same thing. Um, it's a bit different. Uh, it lets you write programs on the fly, and they get compiled and loaded and, and unloaded automatically. Um, more significantly, uh, DTrace programs are, are safe to execute. So they don't provide, uh, DTrace doesn't provide a, a full-blown programming language that lets you uh, perform arbitrary computation in the kernel. It, gives you uh, a fairly limited, but still quite powerful uh, set of programming tools that, uh, that let you answer a lot of questions without the risk of, of crashing your production kernel because you happen to include a bug in your, in your DTrace program that got loaded. So DTrace being a dynamic tracing framework uh, is, is, uh, is a tool that lets you, again, write programs on the fly, load them. Those programs typically collect data they don't have any side effects. In DTrace, it is possible to, to load programs with side effects, but you, you once you do that, you, you're, uh, there, there's no real guarantee that they won't do something that crashes the system. So most of the time when it's used, it's for collecting data and, and no other purpose. It also has a lot of uh, facilities for summarizing data. So instead of uh, you know collecting reams of, of information about the kernel state and filtering it as a post-processing step, DTrace lets you filter it in line. So it, Part of the part of the DTrace language uh, is is um, syntax for for defining predicates that let you filter out uh, events that you're not interested in. So that's another advantage over those those kind of static tools like VMStat, NetStat, so on. They collect a bunch of information for you, and you can customize that to some extent. But ultimately, it's it's quite common to have to do some sort of post processing of their output to get the information that you're actually interested in. So DTrace um, originated in Solaris in the early 2000s. Um, since then, it's been ported to a number of other operating systems, um, for USD, NetBSD. It's quite quite heavily used in Mac OS, although I think, I haven't used it much myself, but my understanding is that uh, it's mostly used indirectly. So there's there's a bunch of tooling in Mac OS that uses DTrace under the hood to provide uh, typically profile information about the, about the uh, operating system. So a bit of history. Um, the, the, the functionality that I described in the last slide isn't, isn't really a new idea. Um, there's been research in this area since the 90s. I think the, one of the earliest references I was able to find was uh, fine-grained dynamic instrumentation of commodity operating system kernels, uh, which is a paper that appeared, I think, in USNIX, um, published in 1999. And those authors developed a, a whole system uh, built on, on Solaris and Spark that let them inject machine code at arbitrary points in the kernel with a few constraints, but, but not a lot. And uh, again, their, their aim was to make it easy, easy to, to dynamically extract information from the kernel, and use that to solve performance problems. Um, and they, they give a few examples of doing that in their paper, which is, which is well worth reading if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, so, and, and really they, they solved, I think, most if not all of the hard problems that, that DTrace solves. Um, there's a lot of uh, complexity around splicing new code into the existing kernel um, and, and doing so in a way that's 
guaranteed in some, some rigorous sense not to crash your system because that really defeats the whole purpose of, of uh, these kinds of tracing systems. So Dtrace itself was in development, I think, or I'm sure for, for several years before it appeared in Solaris 10 in 2003. And uh, I mean, in, in the time since then, it's, it's grown various extensions. It grew the ability to trace not just the kernel, but to trace uh, user processes as well. Um, John Burrell ported it to FreeBSD in the, in the mid 2000s. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what span of years, but 2006, 2008 seems to be the uh, um, seems to be the most active range. Uh, sadly, he passed away in 2009, um, and, and that would, that predates my involvement in FreeBSD, so I never got a chance to meet him. But he did a truly, truly heroic amount of work in, in porting Dtrace to FreeBSD. Um, Dtrace is is fairly complicated system. It has tendrils into low level port or low level pieces of the operating system kernel that it runs in. Um, porting it to, to FreeBSD was, was definitely a lot of work. And he was, I believe, the first person to attempt a port of Dtrace to any other operating system besides Solaris. Um, so uh, his his work has uh, yeah, definitely left a huge legacy. Um, he, in addition to porting Dtrace itself, he, he helped develop a few components of FreeBSD um, that that were required, um, in particular, as I understand it, the the project to write a libelf and the dwarf, the BSD license libelf and the dwarf came uh, uh, partly from John. Um, so Dtrace has been enabled in the AMD 2012, so quite a long time ago. Um, it's been ported to other platforms running or that that FreeBSD runs on, but uh, in my experience, the the ports are. The, the, the AMD64 port is, is the most stable and, and the most time uh, most time tested. So if you're doing a lot of experimentation with Dtrace, I would, I'd suggest doing so on AMD64 unless you run into uh, unless you run into bugs. So I'm just going to try and describe some of the, the high level ideas behind Dtrace. So like I said, it's it's a uh, it's a system that lets you write little programs on the fly, inject them into the kernel and collect the output in a safe manner. So because it's a programming language, Dtrace defines its own language called D, uh, which is kind of an interesting hybrid of, of C and awk. Um, I have a couple of uh, syntax, or I, I have a, a rough syntax sort of uh, layout here. Um, it, it, well, first let me, let me talk about some of the other, uh, some of the other components here. So a probe uh, is a point of instrumentation. So I've mentioned several times the facility that lets you write a program and load it into the kernel. Well, when does that program actually run? It runs, it, the program is attached to a probe, which is almost always uh, specific to, to a point in the kernel code, if that makes sense. So to give a more concrete example that I listed uh, a bit lower, um, we have a, a set of probes for system calls. Every time a system call is uh, executed, we have two probes, an entry and a return probe. So the entry probe fires when the syscall uh, first starts executing, and the return probe fires when uh, the, the system call is finished and is about to return to user mode. So it's possible to attach programs, dtrace programs, to either of those probes for any given system call. So Conceptually, a probe really just corresponds to a piece of kernel code that gets executed. By default, probes are inactive. When you run Dtrace and use it to load a D program into the kernel, the corresponding the, the probes referenced by the program are, are activated, and any kernel thread which executes the corresponding code will call into Dtrace, uh, perform whatever action or actions were defined in the D program, and then return back to what it was doing before. So a provider is uh, a component, like a, a provider just defines a set of logically related probes. Um, so it's, it's part of a, it's, it's to help define a namespace for probes that are otherwise unrelated. So in the examples uh, further down the slide, you can see the first component of that four tuple is, uh, is this is syscall, which is the name of the provider. So there's a number of probes, like I said, one or two for each system call in the kernel. And those fall under the syscall provider. So to give other examples, and I'll list I'll list them more comprehensively in a bit. But we have probes for the scheduler. So there's a number of events 
uh, defined by scheduling decisions made in, in, uh, in the FreeBSD kernel scheduler. Uh, so there's a sched provider for that. There's an IP provider for the, for the network stack, the layer of the network stack that handles IP traffic and IPv6 and, and so on and so on. Um, so the probe name or the probe identifier is, is basically a four tuple. Um, the provider always comes first and then you have a module and a function and name. So those help further break down the, the sets of probes. In the, in the four examples I gave here, you can see they're all, they all belong to the syscall provider. Uh, we have two different modules, FreeBSD and FreeBSD32. So FreeBSD, the first module corresponds to the native system call. FreeBSD32 corresponds to the 32-bit compatibility system call that, that you will find on 64-bit on systems, um, uh, particularly AMD64. So by default, we, we support running 32-bit programs on AMD64. Those programs use a different system call ABI, and we have separate probes for them. Similarly, if you run the, uh, if you use the Linux compatibility layer, the Linux simulator, um, you'll get uh, probes for, for Linux system calls as well. Uh, the function loosely corresponds to the notion of a C function, so you might have multiple probes within a single C function, um, and you might, uh, and so therefore, uh, uh, their, their, their function component is going to be equal. Um, you might also have multiple probes that are, that are logically related but are placed in different C functions. So for instance, um, in the IP provider that I mentioned earlier, we have a probe that fires anytime the IP uh, stack sends a packet. Um, so, but there's multiple, multiple places in the, in the kernel that actually perform that action. So we have an IPv4 stack and IPv6 stack. So there's multiple places where a given probe might logically be placed. Um, and so the function component helps differentiate that. And then the name is, is uh, the final component, which again, yeah, it just helps define the, the probe itself. Um, so that's, that's probes. And if you look at the rest of this line, there's some syntax that looks a lot like awk. So in awk, uh, the model is you take a line, you split it according to a separator, and you perform some some actions on the on the uh, on either the entire line or on its components. Um, and in awk, like like in awk, you can you can define filters. So if there's lines you're not interested in, you can write little tests that let you exclude uh, certain certain types of input. So in dtrace, it's very similar. So probes uh, when they get executed get executed in a certain context that might not be interesting uh, for a given uh, a given consumer. So a predicate lets you kind of cheaply filter out data that you're not interested in line. So this is kind of the, the inverse of what I was talking about before with the static uh, Unix utilities like Netstat and Socksat and so on. Instead of piping their output through grep or through whatever script, you, you filter before you collect any data. And then in actions, uh, the, the actions component is, is basically a whole program. <clears throat> um, this is written in a language that's pretty similar to C. You can you have pointers, you, you have access to C types, as we'll see in a little bit. Um, but typically in, in the body of a probe, uh, you, you're going to be collecting data in some way. So you might be printing it, you might be storing it in a variable um, and, and summarizing that data later. Um, or you might carry out a destructive action, like you're allowed to panic the system if you want to in order to debug something. Uh, so the actual, uh, the, the operations that you actually want to execute in a given context are defined there. So like I said, most, most of the time the actions have no side effects. They just update dtrace variables um, or they, they, they collect some sort of data. And just a note about wildcarding, um, you can refer to many probes at once by by emitting the components that are common or that that, that are that would otherwise differentiate multiple probes. So if I want to filter, if I want to collect data every time f stat is called, I can do that. But if I want to collect data every time any system call is called, I can do that. And similarly, you can add blobs to match uh, multiple probes if you want to. So in FreeBSD, we have the open system call, but we also have open at. And so um, filtering with open star will will catch both of those. So before we get into uh, some examples, some, there, there's a few other components of Dtrace that are worth, uh, 
that are worth looking at. CTF is is uh, certainly one of them. So, you know, we, we have a set of probes in the kernel that you can attach programs to. Um, but if they're, if they're collecting data from the kernel, they have to understand the kernel's types. They have to understand how the kernel encodes data. And so CTF is the, the basic solution for that. And to use Dtrace, you don't really need to know anything about CTF itself, but it helps to understand that there's this, uh, there's this representation of the kernel's, uh, the kernel's types. So if you've ever used a debugger like GDB, you'll be, you know, you run your program under GDB, it knows how to unwind the stack, it knows the names of your functions, it knows the types, or it knows the arguments of your functions and it knows the, uh, the, the types of the arguments in the function. Um, it does that using uh, some debugging metadata in a format called dwarf, which is uh, typically compiled into uh, programs and, and it's compiled into the kernel as well. Um, and that, that dwarf data also contains information about all the, the C types that your program references. So CTF is basically a simplified version of that. Uh, dwarf is, is a very comprehensive debugging format. It includes a lot of information that Dtrace can't really make use of. Um, so CTF is, is a, a simple representation of the, of the type graph in a C program. And if you're a C programmer, you, know, you, you can think of it pretty simply. You have integer types, which are, are base types. You have uh, indirect types, which are um, a type that solely refers to one other type. So you might have an int, and that might be pointer to int, or a type def of int, or uh, you know int with a const qualifier. And then finally, you have compound types, which are structs and unions, which are just a, a list of um, other types. So CTF kind of defines that type graph in a way that's fairly easy to uh, to extract from a, from a programmer from the kernel. So I'm going to switch to the terminal and start showing some examples. Um, and for instance, run CTF dump on your kernel to see its representation of the type graph. So you can see right away we have an integer type. Uh, we have a pointer that refers to uh, another one. Each type has an associated integer identifier, and so on and so on. And uh, this is immediately useful because, again, when you when you attach a pro, uh, pro a Dtrace program to a probe in the kernel, do you want some context uh, for that program to to execute in? So, for instance, if I have a probe that fires every time something sends a signal to another process, I probably want to also be able to get the signal number. Uh, so. Probes that are defined in the kernel have arguments. Those arguments have types, which are defined in uh, using CTF. And in your D program, you can treat them much the same way that you would the corresponding uh, C arguments to a function. Um, to give another example, we have man pages for a few uh, providers that, that FreeBSD provides. Um, and in the man page description, they're, they're kind of defined almost like C functions. So we have IP receive, which takes a bunch of pointers that are described in the main page text, and uh, IP sign as well. Um, Dtrace has a number of global variables that it always provides. Uh, again, that just gives you additional context in your, in your probe. So when a probe fires, it executes in the context of a specific thread. That thread belongs to a process, and that process has a PID. Similarly, uh, it probably has if it corresponds to a user process, it's going to have an executable name. Uh, so there's there's a whole set of global variables that you can reference. Um, and I guess at this point, I should probably note that uh, there's a very good Dtrace, a very good and comprehensive uh, guide to the, the whole language on uh, dtrace.org. It's maintained, I, I believe, by the Lumos developers, um, Lumos being the, the open source descendant of Solaris. Uh, and, and so, you know, has, has a strong culture of using Dtrace. Um, so I'd, I'd strongly encourage you to look there at, at all the different global variables and, and uh, types that Dtrace provides, because uh, uh, they, they often come in handy. It's, it's helpful to have them in your fingers. Um, another piece of technology that, that is used in Dtrace is DIF, which stands for, uh, I believe, Dtrace Intermediate Format. And it's, uh, it's basically a bytecode, so, or a bytecode format. When Dtrace 
compiles your, your D program and loads it into the kernel, it compiles it to DIF bytecode. And when a thread causes a probe to fire and execute your program, it runs a bytecode uh, bytecode executor in the kernel uh, that actually carries out the actions that you requested. And you can use dtrace capital S to dump the, uh, the bytecode for a given script. So if, if you use Linux, um, this basically corresponds to eBPF. Um, and they're, they're conceptually pretty much identical. I think eBPF is probably more powerful in general. I, I don't know all that much about it, to be honest. Um, but if, if you're looking to kind of uh, uh, translate your knowledge of Linux to FreeBSD or to, to any other system that uses DTrace, um, DIF is, is, the, is the thing you're looking for. Again, most DTrace users don't really need to know much at all about it. Um, it's, it's just kind of an internal detail. but. Uh, it's, it's worth understanding that there's a, there's a bytecode format and uh, an execution, execution engine in the kernel. Uh, so in the typical uses of dtrace, you're using it to collect data from the kernel and, and uh, export it to user space. So the way that's done is using uh, buffers that are accessible to both uh, the kernel that's executing a dtrace probe and uh, the dtrace program itself, which pulls data out of that buffer. So the, the typical model is you have a pair of buffers per CPU. One of those buffers is active. So if a probe fires on that CPU, it'll log whatever data is requested to that active buffer. Once a second, the dtrace process will flip the two buffers that are used by each CPU so that the one that was active becomes inactive and the one that was inactive becomes active and then it'll consume data from the now inactive uh, buffer. So by default, it does that switching once a second. So you, you'll see a small pause. If you run dtrace, you'll see a small pause. Um, uh, or rather, you'll see bursts of output. So when dtrace switches the two buffers, it, it kind of drains the, the buffer that had been logged to previously. So you, you, you tend to see that kind of uh, the resulting bursty output. Uh, you can use a dtrace option to increase the switch rate. That's pretty useful because uh, some uh, for, for some scripts, you might be logging a lot of data and you can actually overflow the buffer, in which case data is lost. Uh, that's perfectly safe, but it's not usually desirable unless if you can avoid it. So you can switch more often or you can use larger buffers. Um, finally, there's there's a component dtrace called user space dtrace, which was developed after the initial uh, the initial work on dtrace itself. So dtrace, before I was talking about the kernel, you know, um, the kernel is this big complicated program. It has a lot of internal state. We'd like to extract some of that state so that we can look at it and use that to diagnose problems. It's also possible to embed dtrace probes in uh, user space processes. I mean, there's, there's a lot of user space programs that are, you know, equal if not greater in complexity to the kernel itself. And so having these, uh, having these kinds of tools work on user space as well is, is pretty useful. And I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, okay, so providers. We, FreeBSD has uh, a number of providers in the kernel itself. And you'll see in the, in the third column here, I've listed a few providers that don't really look like they come from the kernel. And that's because uh, th those are user space dtrace providers. Um, so on the, the left two columns define kernel providers. Um, I'm not gonna try and go through all of them, but I'll, I'll give a few highlights. We saw the system call provider already, and I, I talked a little bit about the IP provider. There's similarly TCP and UDP providers, SCED provider for the scheduler, Lockstat, which provides information about the kernel's uh, locking primitives, um, the DT malloc provider, which gives you some information about kernel memory usage. Uh, there's a provider for the Beehive hypervisor, um, and so on and so on. So you can list all of the, the, the probes available on your system using dtrace shl, or you can filter by a specific provider. Um, a number of these man pages, or a, uh, a number of these providers have man pages that you can uh, that you can reference. Not all of them do, unfortunately. Um, I'd love to see uh, you know if, if anyone is willing to to do the work to write some of them, uh, that would be appreciated. Some of the providers that we have are, are things that developers added for their own purposes, and, and so they're really more for as intended as a debugging interface rather than as a, as a something that, as, as something you can uh, base scripts around. 
Uh, okay, so that's a lot of talking that I did. Um, I'm going to try and show you a couple of examples uh, of things using a few different providers. Um, so the first one I wanted to show was uh, skidgraph.d. Uh, so I'm going to start Postgres. It's already running. So here we have a, a canned Dtrace script called skedgraph.d. It was written by uh, uh, Ryan Stone. And it replaces um, some functionality that we are able to get, or it, it, it allows us to extract data without having to compile the kernel to enable a special set of tracing primitives called KTR that you'd otherwise have to use. Um, so you know, it's executable. You can just treat it as that. It'll run as long as, uh, as you want it to. And, and it's a pretty common model with Dtrace to, yeah, just collect data until the user thinks they have enough. Let's log into standard out, so let's actually put that into the file. Yeah. So uh, Postgres is running all the while. Um, so there's, there's going to be a fair amount of scheduler activity. So that's a little bit. It's logging a whole bunch of data to out.ktr. Busy logging. Okay. And then there's a post processing script that we apply. So while it's running, I'll, I'll give you a peek inside uh, skidgraph itself or skidgraph.d. Um, might be a bit hard to see, but the, the basic structure that I described before is, uh, is, is pretty evident. You have a probe, in this case called sked load change. You have a filter, uh, which is just a Boolean check. And then if that filter, if that predicate returns true, we print something to standard A. So if I look at KTR, which is the output of the, uh, the Dscript, you can see a whole bunch of lines about uh, scheduling decisions made by the kernel. And now that that's done, uh, I can log that here and use this uh, skidgraph.py to give me a visual representation of some of that information. So you can see it takes a little bit of time because it's got to parse a whole bunch of input uh, before, before doing anything. And it's going and going and going. So while that's, while that's loading, I'm going to show uh, the other example, which is fortunately a lot uh, less demanding of the system. Uh, so it's, it's uh, program called TCP Top that I wrote as an example for a FreeBSD journal article quite a few years ago. Um, it still happens to work happily. Um, and it's just a kind of top-like program that gives me a rough breakdown of uh, TCP usage by process, which is something that I don't think you can very easily get using system or uh, utilities in the base FreeBSD system. So in this particular case, you can see it's uh, all Firefox, um, and we, we have some indication of how much data it's using. If I SSH to another system, you can see right away that uh, SSH shows up in there. So that's, you know, that, that gives us some confidence that the, uh, the program is, is working as, as you'd expect. Uh, so the sked graph output finished rendering. Um, there's not a lot of detail that I can really pick apart here. But uh, you know, the, the point is that I was able to run this Dtrace script, collect a bunch of data, and, and immediately plot it without having to recompile the kernel, without going through a painful reboot or anything like that. Um, so 
if, if I had reason to suspect that there was a scheduler problem uh, when running this Postgres benchmark, uh, this, this would be a very convenient way to, uh, to start digging into it. So some actions. Um, uh, so, you know, you might have seen in the in the skid graph example, there was a printf. So printf is a pretty common action. It's just as you might expect, prints a line. It's it's going to be very familiar to C programmers. Um, all of the uh, uh, the actions in the left column are are similar. They're 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 just actions which collect data. So printf and stack are the ones that I, I personally use the most. Um, printf is useful for just looking at, say, function arguments. Stack gives me the, the kernel stack of, uh, of a thread executing a particular probe. Um, so you can also print, you, you, you can use the uh, print action to uh, pretty print uh, kernel structures as well. So to give another example, we have the IO provider which fires every time an IO request is submitted. Um, I can use uh, dtrace to, or rather, I can, I can look at the argument types. I see that the first is a, that's a pointer to a struct bio, which is uh, the kernel's representation of a block IO request. So anytime you read or read to, read from or write to a disk, um, a struct bio is gonna get allocated with a bunch of information about where from the disk you want to uh, read from or write to, and, and a bunch of other information. Uh, so if I don't have a particularly good idea of what I'm looking for, I can just print the entire structure. Um, and actually, before I do that, I'm just going to tell it to exit after doing so the first time so that my console isn't uh, spammed. And you can see, I mean, my system is doing some activity, and uh, we have this nice pretty printed struct bio with all of its fields filled out um, that, uh, that could potentially give me a lot of information about uh, you know, where, where, this, uh, where this IO request is going, how large it is. Um, so for instance, uh, bio length, uh, so that's gonna be uh, 32 times four kilobytes, so 128 kilobyte request. Um, similarly, I can, Add a stack action to my script and have it print the uh, a stack trace of the, of the kernel thread executing uh, the IO start probe. So we'll run it again. And so it prints the struct bio as it did before, and now we have uh, a kernel stack. So you can see it was writing a, a cluster of, uh, of UFS file data. So aggregations are another uh, component of the D language. They're the, the I think the, the largest innovation of the D language itself. So like I said, the, the, the syntax is derived from C and awk. Aggregations are, are a fundamentally new thing. Um, so in the examples I've shown so far, the probes, the probe actions consist mostly of printf. So you print a line every time a probe fires. A lot of probes uh, will fire thousands of times a second. Often it's not particularly going to it's not going to be particularly useful to log a line every every time that happens if it's happening at that high frequency. So aggregations let you collect data and basically summarize them in, in uh, a statistical manner, perhaps. Um, so an aggregation is is just a variable. Uh, it it's uh, it consists of, of a name follow, or uh, following an ampersand. Um, Sorry, not an ampersand, the, the add symbol. Um, it has an optional set of keys, and then uh, uh, it, it's set equal to uh, an aggregation function of the value that you're interested in collecting. Um, so I, I think it's actually pretty hard to explain this in an intuitive way without examples. Um, it took me a while to, to understand it. So rather than try to give you a, a precise and formal definition, I'm just going to show you some, some examples. And so what I'll do here is, is uh, measure how long it takes for the kernel to do uh, TLB invalidation. Uh, so if you don't know what that is, it's uh, if the TLB is a hardware cache that's uh, present in, in you know, all modern computer systems. It, it caches uh, virtual to physical memory translations. Um, it's not really important. The point is it's a cache that occasionally has to be invalidated by the operating system. Um, 
TLB invalidation is usually a pretty expensive operation. So if your kernel is doing it a lot, that's most likely going to represent a performance problem that you're that you're going to want to do something about. So I happen to know that all TLB invalidation happens in functions called pmap underscore invalidate underscore star. So what I'm going to do to measure the amount of time it takes to execute this particular function is set a variable to the current time. And when returning from the function, if we recorded a time, print out the amount of time elapsed. So you can see we're getting a whole bunch of numbers. It's a lot of output. Um, I'd be interested in seeing a, a distribution of these numbers just so I can see if there's any outliers or anything like that. So that's what aggregations let me do. So rather, so we're going to keep the timestamp, um, but rather than printing it every single time, I'm going to use a, an anonymous aggregation. So I, I, I could give it a name, my ag in the example, but you don't actually have to if there's just one of them. So now it's running. It's collecting data. It doesn't print it. So an aggregation's contents are printed when you when you uh, uh, when when dtrace exits. As a FreeBSD extension, you can also get it to print aggregations by sending it a siginfo. Uh, so if you use Control T, you get a nice little histogram. So what does this actually tell us? Or tell us um, the amount of time taken to execute a particular TLB invalidation operation. So the numbers in the so. A timestamp gives you uh, uh, the, the current time as, as just a, a number of nanoseconds. So basically, we're counting the number of nanoseconds elapsed from beginning to end of the operation. So you can see the most common amount of time is between 1,024 to 2,048 nanoseconds, so one to two microseconds. Um, we don't seem to have any outliers. I'll let it run for a little bit longer, but still nothing all that interesting. Okay. So I didn't use any keys there, um, but again, if you know a little bit, uh, oh, sorry, do we have a question? What's the what's one of the most interesting or difficult issues you've solved using Dtrace? Um, I'm going to punt on that for a bit. I'll try to keep thinking about it in the background, and then maybe by the end of the talk, I'll I'll try and give an answer. Usually, I don't solve a problem by D, using Dtrace. The, the the model is I, there, there's a problem that I want to understand. I, there's something I don't understand. So I start asking questions, and I use Dtrace to ask those questions. And as it helps me answer, you know, my, my, my clarity, the, the clarity of my understanding of the problem uh, is improved. So it's, it's really just another tool that, like, uh, among others, uh, you know, helps, helps with conceptualizing a problem, which is obviously the first step before solving it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to come up with something a bit more specific. Um, what's a good guide, good starting guide to integrate more user land Dtrace with FreeBSD, e.g. integrating Dtrace probes in a Go Python Rust program? Um, I don't know that there's a lot of guides uh, for that particular topic. Um, user land Dtrace is not all that well documented, and it's, it's a bit arcane because to embed Dtrace probes into a into a program, you have to modify the build system to include some extra post processing steps, um, and that that tends to cause problems in projects with complicated build systems, um, like Python, for instance, or, or Rust. Um, so if I, I I can try and I would point you at existing providers. So I, I listed them uh, in a previous slide. Postgres, Ruby, Tickle, uh, Perl all provide Dtrace probes. So a starting point would be to go look at how they do that and, and try to emulate it. I know there is a patch to add probes to Python, but I think it wasn't accepted by the uh, core developers. 
Um, I remember that someone at Isilon integrated it into uh, into their operating system, so it was possible to trace um, Python programs. But I don't think there's official support for it in the Python project. Uh, so going back to the TLB invalidation example, so we had a single aggregation. Um, if you know a little bit about TLB invalidation in FreeBSD, at least there's a few different modes in which it can happen. Um, in particular, there's, as implied by the blog used in the uh, example, um, there's, there's a few different TLB invalidation types. So rather than lump them all into the same set, I'm gonna uh, differentiate using the, uh, the probe function. So probe func is just another D variable uh, which represents the uh, the function component of the probe that it's executing it. So I'm going to let that run for a little bit. Hit Control T, and now you can see I have two histograms. One's uh, pmap invalidate all. One's pmap invalidate page. I'm going to start a build kernel in another terminal. So that'll uh, get a bit more information. And you can see there's actually some warnings being logged. Um, uh, the kernel is producing information faster than the dtrace program can consume it. Um, if you it, most of these most of these sorts of things can be solved by uh, increasing uh, increasing the amount of buffer space available. Um, there is some ongoing work to to implement auto tuning these buffers, but uh, um, it's it's not quite there yet. Okay, so I have a bunch of work happening in the background. You can see I have a few different histograms now. Uh, the key is printed up here. So we have a few different keys corresponding to the to the C function that I'm timing. And uh, so the, the comment, or the most important part is the, the third. So we have pmap invalidate page, pmap invalidate all, pmap invalidate range. Um, all of these extra uh, identifiers correspond to special modes. So depending on what CPU you're using, we might do TLB invalidation a certain way. If you have meltdown mitigations enabled, um, which I hope we do. You'll see uh, um, different TLB invalidation modes uh, enabled. So the interesting thing to note here is that uh, there's actually different distribution uh, depending on the mode. So um, PMAP invalidate page. Having rewatched a, a bit of the stream that went out on Friday, I think I should probably go back a little bit and explain in, in a bit more detail exactly what it is that I'm measuring. Um, so, like I said, TLB invalidation is, is just a type of hardware cache invalidation operation that the operating system has to perform. Um, in some workloads, it does that very frequently. And in a lot of cases, it's a fairly expensive operation because it involves signaling multiple CPUs. So there's, uh, there's an initiator which begins a TLB invalidation. It raises an interrupt on, uh, on other CPUs in the system, waits for them to acknowledge them, and then returns. So it's a, it's a fairly expensive operation. And because it interrupts other CPUs, potentially, um, it, it's, uh, it can have a lot of impact on system performance. So in FreeBSD, there's a few functions uh, that start with the name pmap underscore invalidate uh, that perform a TLB invalidation. Uh, and there's, there's a few different modes that it operates in. So if you think about any, any kind of cache that you might maintain in software, uh, it's, it's possible that you might want to invalidate a single entry or a group of related entries, or you might want to invalidate the entire cache. So there's different invalidation modes, and that occurs uh, with TLB invalidation as well. So uh, if you actually open the kernel sources, uh, you can see, for instance, uh, we have a few different functions, C functions, uh, which, which perform the invalidation. Obviously, the operator the details are fairly complicated, but the point is there's there's a few C functions in the kernel, uh, and I'd like to measure the amount of time uh, elapsed during their execution. So last week, uh, I gave an example just using a single aggregation to measure all TLB invalidations. So uh, without, uh, without using any kind of key in the aggregation, uh, if I run a build kernel in the background to generate some load, and I hit Control T after running this script, this well, really just a dtrace one-liner. I get a nice little histogram with uh, with the timing in nanoseconds uh, for for TLB invalidation. So you can see uh, the most common 
range of, of times is uh, about one to two microseconds. And because there's different modes and one might reasonably expect that certain modes are cheaper to uh, execute than others, I can get more sort of resolution into my, into my data by adding a key to the aggregation and splitting the timings between the different modes uh, by using the, <clears throat> the name of the, the C function, which is also the name of the probe, or which is the name of the, the probe function, um, using that to, to split out the data that I collect. So now we have a separate histogram for each of the three modes, uh, PMAP invalidate page, uh, PMAP invalidate range, and PMAP invalidate all. And so when I hit Control-T, while sampling the data, I have these three histograms. And in fact, uh, there's, there's a, a bit of a difference in that uh, the, the single page invalidation seems to be slightly cheaper than, than invalidating the entire TLB, which is in turn slightly cheaper than invalidating a range. And that intuitively makes some sense. Invalidating a range, uh, at least on, on x86 systems, basically just involves invalidating a single page in a loop. Uh, so we'd expect that to be to be more expensive than uh, invalidating a single page. Um, so it's possible to add multiple keys to an aggregation. If I wanted to further break down the timing is based on the stack of the kernel thread initiating the TLB invalidation, I can do that by adding another key. And again, continuing to collect some uh, uh, profiling info. So here, the, the output basically consists of the two keys. The first key is the function name, the probe function, probe func, and the second is the kernel stack. Um, so here it's uh, a, a thread called VM page at worker that's, that's performing TLB invalidations and we have some timings for those. Um, also from page worker, page at worker. And scrolling up, you can see that there's some TLB invalidation operations occurring in the uh, IO stack, which have uh, significantly larger uh, uh, overhead and so on and so on. So I, I think that sort of procedure where you, where you use DTrace to collect coarse grain data and then refine it iteratively is, is a fairly common pattern, at least when I use DTrace. Um, I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, so I'll try to capture a whole bunch of data and then start to uh, start to hone in on specific details. So in this example, I use the quantize um, uh, aggregation function. Uh, there are several others. Quantize is quite useful. Um, quantize and L-quantize both produce histograms, and uh, the other the other functions can collect uh, various statistical properties of your of your data. Um, so it's a very very simple example. I can do something like uh, use the count aggregation function simply to, to count the number of uh, uh, TLB invalidation operations that occur every second. Uh, so So in this particular example, I'm using an aggregation to simply count instances of the probe firing, and then using a second probe, the uh, tick dash, tick dash uh, one second probe, which fires once a second. Um, I print the aggregation, reset it, and uh, so in that way, I kind of get a delta uh, each time the probe fires. So you can see while I'm running a, a build kernel in the background, I get several thousand TLB invalidations per second, which is actually uh, quite high. Um, and if I were specifically interested in their impact on system performance, I could use DTrace to see, okay, well, not all TLB invalidations, TLB invalidation operations are gonna interrupt a remote CPU. Um, the ones that do are the most expensive, and so I might want to collect some information about how often uh, those kinds of invalidations are happening. So if, if most of these TLB invalidations involve interrupting other CPUs, that's probably an issue. If not, then you know, it might be acceptable. It depends on what's motivating uh, the, the investigation. So continuing with a few other uh, DTrace providers of interest, um, I didn't explain it before, but uh, in that example, I was using the FBT provider to trace uh, a couple of, or uh, a, a small set of C functions in the kernel. Um, so the providers that I described before mostly correspond to logical system events. 
So there's, like I said, a probe that fires every time the network stack sends it an IP packet. Um, there's a probe that fires every time a signal is delivered to a process. There's a probe that fires every time a system call is executed. So those are all kind of high level probes. They correspond to high level events in the kernel. Um, the actual implementation of all of that functionality is, is obviously a bit more complicated. Um, and the FBT provider gives you a bit more control over what exactly it is, or rather where it is that your probes, uh, probes end up. So FBT creates a probe automatically for every single C function in the kernel with, with some caveats applied to that statement. Um, but it's very useful if you're, again, just trying to get uh, a sort of first look at what the system is doing in a particular scenario. So if you have um, some, some functions that you, if, if for some reason you suspect that a particular subsystem is involved in a problem, you can very quickly see if any of those functions are being called. Um, there's, there's really quite a few uses for it. The downside of it is that you have to be willing to look at the kernel sources in order to, to write scripts. And the other, and, and moreover, because it's, because the probe names are based on kernel code, which, which changes pretty dramatically over time, it's possible to write a script that works properly on one kernel FreeBSD 12.0, but then stops working on FreeBSD 12.2 because the corresponding function was moved or renamed or deleted or, or something like that. Um, and like I said, it's, it's actually not, not quite possible to trace every single function in the kernel. Um, the compiler reorganizes things uh, in such a way that a, a C function, a, a given C function might not be traceable. But in practice, um, uh, quite a few of them are. I think if you, if you for instance, uh, list all of the dtrace FPT probes in a running kernel, you see there's quite a few. Uh, so 90,000 in my case, which is uh, often, often enough to, to do what you want. And there's a related provider called the PID provider, which is effectively the same idea, um, but it allows you to collect uh, function boundary probes, meaning uh, probes corresponding to a function call and a function return uh, for user space programs as well. And I'll just give a quick example of that. Because um, I think it's a bit more intuitive to, to folks that are listening but aren't necessarily uh, kernel developers. Um, I think all of us have, have wanted to be able to, you know, just get a, a nice sort of flow graph of, uh, of all the function calls that happen um, in, in, say, a program invocation, and that's something you can do with dtrace. So using the PID, PID provider, I'll, I'll show you how uh, you can trace function calls in uh, grep. So I'm going to match. Um, all of the function entry probes and all of the function return probes in uh, fgrep, which is the, the sort of true name of the uh, grep executable. And because I didn't attach any probe action to it, it's just going to be the uh, sort of default action, which prints, prints the probe name. The dash capital F uh, flag is, is kind of a special uh, a special output formatting flag for dtrace, which tells it to, to show you the uh, how, how function calls are nested, and it'll become a bit more clear what I mean in a, in a second. Let's actually show the output. Um, and finally, I'm going to uh, tell dtrace to, to run a specific command and attach to it. So all of the probes that I'm enabling here apply only to the specific process. So when uh, when the grep uh, invocation, so just grepping for a lot of messages for a specific string. Uh, so when this grep process runs, um, dollar sign target is going to be replaced with the uh, PID of the grep process and all of the uh, uh, all of the function entry and return probes in that process are going to be enabled. So I run that and it right away prints a whole bunch of output. So scrolling back to the top, oops, uh, you can see pretty close to the top we're calling main which calls a specific presumably our regular expression compiler in grep itself and does a bunch of things with it. Um, so, I mean, I'm not at all familiar with grep's internals, but it's uh, it's a pretty neat way to get a to get a quick glimpse at uh, uh, what exactly grep does, the structure of the uh, program itself, and if you were interested in profiling a specific portion of grep that you might think is taking a long time, or at least an unexpectedly long time, um, you could do things like attach timestamps to these. Uh, to these function calls to see how much time is actually being spent 
in each one. And so in that way you can kind of get a, a representation of where grep actually spends its time. And in fact, I'm gonna show you in a bit uh, an example uh, of a data visualization technique called flame graph, which is uh, really based on, on that same idea. Okay, so the last few slides I wanna show are basically, basically consist of uh, examples of programs that use D-trace under the hood. So, um, so far I've been typing D-trace commands into the command line and, and running them. Um, with some practice, uh, I think you know, anyone can do that, but it, it, it's, it's a bit daunting to, to have to write these little programs on the command line, I think. Um, D-trace benefits, D-trace is quite powerful, but it benefits a lot from higher level programs that can use D-trace to collect information and, and present it in a, in a more consumable way rather than forcing you to kind of start from scratch each time and, and come up with the probes that you want to enable and, and figure out exactly what you want to trace and format the output and so on. Uh, so we actually don't have all that many programs that use D-trace in the base system, the base FreeBSD system, but uh, one that we do have, and, and one that I think quite a few kernel developers use, is uh, Lockstat. Um, so earlier I mentioned the Lockstat provider, which is uh, a kernel provider that gives information about the kernel synchronization primitives. So the kernel, in many ways, is just a regular C program. It's a multi-threaded C program, um, and it uses uh, it uses quite a few different techniques to synchronize execution between different CPUs when they're accessing shared memory. Um, but they, they do make heavy use of the sort of venerable mutexes that, uh, that one encounters uh, pretty quickly after you start writing multi-threaded code. So we have a few different flavors of mutexes, um, uh, reader-writer locks. Uh, really, we have mutexes and reader-writer locks, but several flavors of each, depending on the constraints in which they're used. Um, so in any sufficiently large multi-threaded uh, program, that uses those kinds of synchronization primitives are gonna come up against issues where a certain lock is, is monopolized by a certain thread or uh, the system's ability to, to handle a certain workload becomes bottlenecked on a specific lock. So um, even though you have lots of CPUs that are performing work for you, uh, if they all have to acquire the same lock in order to do that work, uh, you'll, you'll quickly end up with a bottleneck and the more CPUs you have, the larger the bottleneck. So, for eliminating those kinds of problems in the kernel, um, we've made fairly extensive use of Lockstat. And uh, that's a very, I would say it's a fairly straightforward program that's, uh, that's quite handy in these kinds of situations. So to, to motivate what I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna run a specific program uh, in, in this uh, will it scale source directory. So Will at Scale is a collection of programs that do one specific operation in a loop. And the whole point of them is to find kernel bottlenecks. So this particular example that I've started called ThreadSpawn um, is, is a program that creates a thread using pthread create, um, sets it to run a handler which does nothing. And then the original thread waits for the, the newly created thread to exit. So all of this does is really stress the thread creation and destruction code in the kernel. And what the loop does is it calculates the number of threads it was able to create and destroy every second and just print that. So running a single instance of this loop, um, you get about 38,000 thread creation and destruction events per second. So the question now is, well, okay, the system that I'm running the program on has uh, 32 CPUs. So if I run 32 instances of this loop, um, if all goes well, the total number of, of thread creation and destruction events should be 32 times this number. And so I'm not good enough at mental arithmetic to tell you exactly what that is, but um, let's see if we get something that looks uh, approximately like that when I spawn for two. Um, so we went from about 38,000 close to 40,000 to 180,000, even though we uh, multiplied the, the number of instances of the program by 32. So, I mean, you, you don't have to be very good at mental arithmetic to, to see that that really isn't scaling linearly. Um, it seems quite likely that there's uh, a bottleneck in the kernel. That means that even adding more cores to do the same work doesn't give you uh, a corresponding improvement in the throughput. 
So using Lockstat without having any sort of clue as to as to where the problem is, uh, Lockstat would be a very good choice. That's, that's just a just to rule out the possibility of lock contention or to confirm it. Um, in this case, I, I happen to know what the problem is and, and uh, it's, it's certainly related to lock contention. So I'll start this uh, program up again in another terminal, uh, run a lockstat invocation to show me all events of um, kernel mutex or kernel lock contention. So lock contention happens when a thread goes to acquire a lock, discovers that another thread holds the lock, and so has to, it has to back off and wait for that lock to become free before it can do any useful work. So the dash capital C flag uh, asks Lockstat to look for contention events. Um, and this, this extra parameter here goes directly to libd trace, and it's basically uh, just making sure that we have enough buffers available uh, to, to collect a lot of data. So I'm just running it with a command of sleep 10, so all it's doing is collecting information for 10 seconds and then uh, exiting. So it could be tied to the uh, invocation of a specific command, yeah, but for now it's just a mention of the back. Um, so you can see there's, there's a few different sets of data here. Um, and, and this basically corresponds to different types of contention events involving different types of locks. Um, right away, this, these two lines at the bottom stand out. Um, we're seeing roughly 175,000 contention events per second. So 175,000 times a second, a thread in the kernel attempted to acquire a specific lock and wasn't able to do so immediately. So it's basically going to be burning CPU doing nothing while it waits for that lock to become free. Um, and we can see that the two functions implicated in these contention events are called VM thread stack back, which definitely seems related to what I'm doing because the benchmark program is doing nothing but creating and destroying threads. So scrolling up, you can see certain types of locks really aren't contended. If you're seeing contention events in, in say the dozens or even the hundreds per second, um, that's, that's typically not a major problem in and of itself. And scrolling back up here, um, there does seem to be a fairly large amount of uh, uh, contention on this specific lock called kernel arena. Um, it's not really important what that does, but uh, I, I can say again, having looked at the problem a bit, that, that it is uh, a sort of secondary, um, secondary effect of, uh, of the, uh, the, the bottleneck. So uh, Luxat has a number of other uh, options that you can use to get, again, more, more information. Um, when I was showing the TLB invalidation example, I added stacks to, uh, to the histograms. Um, so you can do the same sort of thing using, uh, well, that's not like that. So I wanted to show, uh, stack traces together with the contention events. Uh, and it's, it's possible to do that with the trace, or with uh, with Lockstat, rather. So running it again. Um, I can see that uh, the, the lock contention that we were seeing before, the VM object lock contention, uh, is associated with this particular stat, or stack. And that's coming from the system call, systhread new, which again, corresponds exactly to the benchmark that I'm running. So right away, without knowing anything about the problem using Lockstat, you can very possibly pinpoint the, the source of a kernel bottleneck if you're able to, uh, to reproduce it. Um, so yeah, Lockstat has a number of other options for uh, slicing and dicing lock contention data. Um, the other, the other types of events that it's useful for is, is measuring hold times. So rather than, uh, rather than a probe firing every time a thread attempts to acquire a lock, acquire a lock and is unable to, you can, uh, you can have a probe fire every time a, a mutex is unlocked and you can use that probe to get information about how long the lock was held. Uh, so for, uh, for finding cases where, um, 
where locks are held for a long time and, and thus blocking other threads, uh, the, the hold event would be pretty useful. So again, here, just changing the, uh, the, the event type to, to look for holds, uh, you can get uh, a whole bunch of fairly detailed info. So a lot of this is, is really unrelated to the benchmark. It's just kind of background activity. Um, but again, with locks out, it's possible, possible to filter out all but the sort of most frequent events so that you can, you can drill down into a specific problem and clear out some of the noise. And uh, just to give you a sense of what the corresponding Btrace script looks like, you can add dash capital B. And you can see this uh, fairly uh, You can see there's a fairly long D-trace script um, that gets emitted. So you can, you can get a sense for uh, uh, exactly what it's using under the hood. And if, if need be, write your own uh, uh, D-trace script based on that to collect more specific information if locks that doesn't do what you need. And so uh, flame graphs are a, a data visualization tool. Um, their, their use was pioneered by uh, Brendan Gregg uh, back when, when he was doing a lot of work on D-Trace and, and uh, he, he basically wrote a set of scripts that help process profiling data collected by D-Trace and create a visual representation of them. Um, so there's a lot of ways to create flame graphs and, and as usual, the best way to talk about them is probably to start by looking at an example. Uh, but the basic idea is to find out where uh, a certain resource which might be just time is, is being spent. And the idea is to sample usage of that resource and, uh, and build up a graph of, uh, of uh, the, the stack where, where that resource is being consumed. So here's uh, an example flame graph that I collected uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, which shows the, the amount of time spent in various kernel functions as, uh, as a function of, of the amount of time spent in the caller. So in this particular example, it, you, you kind of immediately get from this graph that uh, whatever was happening on the system, most of the, most of the CPU time uh, was idle, and then I have a, a a collection of time spent in this particular stack. So the, the flame graph just provides a, a sort of visual representation of some of the information that I've showed already. Um, so to give, uh, to, to tie it back to the um, thread creation benchmark, uh, what I can do is uh, use, uh, use flame graphs to see precisely what's happening when that lock intention occurs. So if, uh, Clone the, um, the flame graph git repository, which is uh, just Brendan Gregg's repo on uh, GitHub. There's a README uh, with, with lots of info about how to collect information, the, the sort of raw data that gets used for, uh, for flame graphs. So the particular example for Dtrace uses uh, uh, the profile provider, which is uh, a provider whose probes just fire at fixed rate per second. So this is uh, basically a way to do sampling uh, of, of, uh, of the kernel. And after t uh, 30 seconds, uh, the sampling stops. And all of the stacks that were traced get recorded to a file, and uh, we can uh, go to classes. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I'll lower the, uh, the amount of time spent, of course. So I have the benchmark still running. Uh, and you'll notice that even though we're, we're collecting data with Dtrace, the, the actual rate hasn't changed since I started the script. So this, this actually has fairly minimal uh, uh, impact on the, on the system's performance, even though lots of probes are enabled, or rather, even though uh, probes are firing fairly frequently. 
So in this particular case, we use a, a helper script called stack collapse. I believe it's Dietrich's. So the dtrace output is post-processed using uh, one Perl script. And then there is plain graph, which takes the post-processed output and creates an SVG that you can open in a browser. So uh, I'll do that here. So this is the uh, uh, this quite look right. hmm. This seems to be the, the this is showing lots of uh, ZFS activity. Um, so it's clearly not what I just uh, not what I just traced. Obviously, I made a mistake somewhere, and I, I don't really want to go back and search for it. But um, uh, it, it's just another example of, uh, of what kind of information you get. So in this particular case, it looks like the system is doing a lot of. Um, oh, I see. So the thread. So there. Okay. I must be running something else on the system. At the sure what that is. But in any case, um, if we drill down into the uh, thread uh, systhrnu, which is the system call which uh, creates and destroys thread threads, um, you can see there's indeed quite a lot, quite a lot of lock contention in, uh, in these two functions, k-stack import and zone free item. So almost all the execution time is being spent in this function called lock delay, which does nothing but spin uh, while, uh, while waiting for a lock to become free. So that's that's a clear bottleneck right there. And finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, dwatch, or at least show a, a, a simple example. So dwatch is um, a set of, uh, I believe, mostly shell scripts that service wrappers around dtrace and make it a bit easier to extract context from specific probes. So um, once again, we, we have lots of high-level probes in the kernel um, showing you information about but signals are being sent when when system calls get executed and so on. But you have to know exactly what information you want to extract um, in order to tell dtrace to do that. By default, if you don't provide any actions in a dtrace script, dtrace just prints the probe function, um, which which is or rather the probe name, which is useful but doesn't really give you all that much information. Um, so dwatch is uh, is um, a collection of of scripts and, and a sort of framework that wraps dtrace probes in and makes it a lot easier, uh, or makes the process of extracting information from them more automatic and a lot easier. And uh, as usual, it's it's easiest to look uh, using examples. And um, I'm just going to show a very very brief one here. Uh, again, the main page is is quite useful, and I encourage anyone interested to go look at it and try out some of the examples. Um, but here. I've asked dwatch to trace exactly each uh, events. And so right away, the script starts printing information uh, about every single process that gets executed. So if I go and start a build, for instance, uh, you can see all of the different uh, programs that get invoked uh, during that build. So without even having to specify all that information that gets uh, extracted automatically. And as I mentioned, there's quite a few different uh, examples in the man page that are worth looking at. Um, and that's uh, actually all I wanted to talk about for, for Dtrace. There's there's quite a few things I didn't mention at all. And um, I'd again like to plug the, the Illumos uh, Dtrace guide that's available on dtrace.org, uh, which has a much more comprehensive uh, overview of, of all of the different functionality that's available. Um, but hopefully, the, the examples that I showed in, in both Friday's session and today's uh, 
are, uh, are useful starting points for, for people that want to use DTrace as a tool to, to investigate the system a bit more and, and get a better understanding of what's actually going on under the hood. Um, so if, if you have any questions about these specific examples, and I'm, I'm happy to answer them now, or, or please feel free to, to message me on IRC or, or send me an email. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there's, there's lots of very useful resources available on the internet. Uh, for those that are that are interested in exploring DTrace a bit more, um, so I think that's it for me. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for uh, letting me talk about DTrace. Thanks, Mark. So let's see here. Can no, oh, go ahead, Deb. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Okay, I guess yeah. you must. <laughs> there, there weren't any questions, right? Or oh, okay. I, I do see one. Yes. Okay, and I'll let you continue that. <laughs> Uh, the question is, where do you see DTrace going and what's next? Um, it's a good question. I, so I think a lot of the innovation that's happening around tracing right now is, is happening in Linux with eBPF. Um, for a long time, Linux didn't really have any kind of answer to DTrace as far as I understand it. Like I, my experience is with, with Linux is pretty minimal, at least in this area. Um, but I think they've they've come a long way in the past ten years, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of new features being added there that don't necessarily have a counterpart in DTrace. Um, so, what's next for for DTrace and FreeBSD? I think, I mean, without being an expert on on eBPF myself, I would I would spend time looking at its capabilities and seeing what what DTrace lacks. Um, I do think. It would be useful to start thinking about a DTrace 2.0 and, and looking at some of the deficiencies in DTrace and, and seeing what we can do about them. Um, I think my largest frustration is the problem that I think DWatch aims to mitigate to some extent, which is that you know if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, it's hard to phrase a question. DTrace is, is useful for answering questions, but if, if you don't know exactly what that question is, it's, it's, uh, it can be challenging. So um, I'd, I'd like to see some improvements around discoverability, making information easier to extract without having to, to manually specify everything. So DWatch, I think, helps a lot in that. Um, the other thing that, that I frequently get stymied by is um, difficulty when it comes to sort of end-to-end -end tracing. So, you know, I can use the network providers to trace packets, I can use the IO provider to trace IO at certain layers, but if I want to show some sort of representation of all the activity that happens when um, a user space program, you know, sends data on a socket and that, and, and that data gets transformed by various components of the network stack and then through the driver, there, there's no sort of, uh, there's no way to trace that from beginning to end, really. I have to know exactly, I have to know ahead of time uh, where I need to add probes and, and where I need to enable them. And, and so it's, it's I, and I don't know if that's really a deficiency in DTrace or rather it's just the, a lack of sort of higher level tooling around it. But um, uh, any kind of system for, for tracing IO basically through the system from beginning to end and uh, being able to to follow that without having to manually set things up would be would be very useful, I think. Um, yeah, those those are my main sort of complaints with DTrace. As a kernel developer, there's other sort of niche features that I wish it had. Um, the the FBT provider is fairly limited in that you can only trace function entry and exit. Some functions in the FreeBSD kernel are unfortunately very large. And I'd like to be able to dynamically add probes to the middle without having to recompile everything, but that's that's currently not possible. Okay, thanks, Mark. Yep. Um, I think that's it for questions. So, Deb, if you want to hop back on. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, that was an excellent talk. I am definitely going to have to watch the recording uh, from Friday to review, um, especially like the introductory part of it, because there was just so much information that was uh, great. And 
I think it's going to be great having this as a recording too, because um, even though it's longer than the hour now, I believe there's so much good information on that. I think this will be great for the community as well as new people. And, um, and uh, since it is a recording, then people go watch chunks of it and, um, you know, and then always review things. So this has been great. So again, I want to thank you for stepping in and doing this. Um, also dealing with some of the technical issues that we had and coming back today <laughs> and, um, and doing this talk. So um, for the community, um, we will be editing the two recordings and put them together soon. And so we should have these on our website soon, today or tomorrow. And so you can, if you haven't had a chance to watch the first part, then you'll have a chance to do that. So... Um, I also want to thank Alan Jude for stepping in at the last minute and really at the last minute because we were having uh, a few more uh, issues today and he was able to step in and, and help us with the recording <clears throat> and the streaming. And so we really appreciate that. And so he, he stepped in um, for us a few times. And so thank you, Alan, so much. So our next talk will be December 11th. And so that's uh, like, um, two and a half weeks from now. And the talk will be an introduction to Capsicum and it'll be by Marius Zaborski. And so, um, so anyway, that will be really interesting too. So we look forward to seeing you in about two and a half weeks. So thank you.